it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. child at the bus stop. The car's engine revved as I sped down the road. Lost in thought, I hardly took notice of the rain crashing against the windshield. The storm was rising. Nature seemed to sense my anger. I took another sip from the bottle of vodka beside me. My eyes darted from the road to the shiny black handgun lying on the passenger seat. I brushed the cold metal with the tip of my finger. Voluntarily, my mind flooded with images of my oldest daughter, Mara. Her entire life played through my mind in mere seconds. My last memory of Mara was from when I had to identify her body in the morgue. My hands started shaking. An uncontrollable tremor spread across my body. I pulled the car over, unable to continue. I slammed my fist against the steering wheel. The images of the morgue would not leave me. I closed my eyes. There she was, lying on the metal table. A blanket had been carefully draped over her body, only revealing her pale face. She'd just turned sixteen, yet death seemed to have aged her well beyond that. The pathologist had placed his hand on my shoulder. I hadn't been able to comprehend the words he said. The man's actions had seemed so forced and well-practiced, it had only angered me more. I asked for a moment alone. After the doctor had left, I hesitantly placed my hand on my daughter's cheek. Almost instantly, I pulled it back. She felt so cold. I stared at her lower abdomen, where I knew the knife had pierced her. For a fraction of a second, I contemplated pulling away the blanket to expose the wound. Yet I couldn't muster the strength. She looked peaceful now, as if she was sleeping. I feared exposing the wound which had killed her would somehow change that. That had been a little more than a month ago. The police had quickly caught the youth who committed the crime. Some bum who'd attempted to rob her and had wielded his knife a little too over-enthusiastically. He had murdered her even though she'd given him her purse. I punched the steering wheel again. It wasn't fair. The youth's trial had been yesterday. He'd been acquitted on account of procedural mistakes by the police. The man had smiled at me as they led him out of the courtroom. It wasn't fair. That bum had destroyed my life at an astounding rate. My wife could barely stand to look at me anymore. A week ago she'd moved out of the house and had taken our youngest daughter with her. She told me I needed help. She would said she couldn't watch me ruin my life. Well, I can't blame her. The past month had led me to drown my sorrow with liquor. I couldn't let go of my pain. It had festered into an uncontrollable rage. All I could think about was the injustice of it all. All I could see was the pale face of my dead daughter. All I wanted was to kill the man responsible. It had become an obsession. I had been unable to console my wife. My youngest daughter had practically not spoken since the loss of her sister. I found her quietly curled up in Mara's bed most days, unable to let go, unable to move on, and it broke my heart. I'd felt a strange sense of relief watching them both drive away. I didn't need them to see what happened next. I didn't want my youngest daughter to see her dad being taken away for murder. I preferred the solitude and the warm embrace of alcohol. My eyes darted back at the gun and I sighed. I had to do this, otherwise I would never know peace. Determined, I turned the ignition key. The car gently purred before reverting into stillness. I turned the key again. Nothing happened. I cursed loudly and tried again. Nothing. I took out my frustration on the steering wheel until both my hands ached. I grabbed my phone ready to call a tow truck. But it wouldn't switch on. The wind was howling outside. I checked the time on my watch, but the handles had stopped moving. Everything seemed in suspension. After a short internal debate, I decided. The thought of remaining in the car suddenly seemed unbearable. 
Feeling restless, I kicked open the door and got out of the car. I hastily stuffed the gun in my jacket pocket. While the storm was livid, the rain poured down with such force it temporarily deafened the other thoughts shooting through my mind. I was drenched within seconds, but it didn't bother me. I started to walk down the road, crossing a little bridge over the river. Mumbled curses escaped my lips as I realized I was lost. A cold mist of grey lazily spread around me. Not knowing what else to do, I continued walking until a light in the distance pierced through the mist's veil. Like a moth, I gravitated towards it. Its source was a small bus stop. Relieved to have found some cover, I fell back into one of the metal seats. My hands felt numb. I rubbed them together for a couple of moments before reaching into my pocket for my packet of cigarettes. After taking a drag, I closed my eyes and leaned back against the bus stop. The tremor subsided as I blew out a small cloud of smoke. Without instruction, my mind drifted back towards the youth who had killed my daughter. A familiar doubt swept over me. I'd always valued human life. As a family man, I'd constantly tried to maximize everyone's happiness. Now here I was, committed to blowing a hole in the head of my daughter's murderer. I turned around and looked at my reflection in the glass. I didn't recognize the pale, lined face staring back at me. Droplets of rain were slowly sliding down the glass. It gave my reflection even more of a somber appearance. I looked back in front of me and took another drag of the clammy cigarette between my fingers. Closing my eyes, I exhaled, expelling another cloud of smoke. Rough day. The voice startled me. The cigarette slipped from between my lips and fell down my shirt. I jumped up, swearing as I felt the ash scorch my chest. Jesus Christ, I muttered at the young boy before me. The boy grinned. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I shrugged and sat back down. The boy took a seat next to me. Oh, it holds a strange beauty, doesn't it? I looked over at him. What does? He nodded at the storm outside. There was another silence. I broke it by standing and beginning to pace up and down the little bus stop. When's the goddamn bus going to get here? The boy gave me an appraising look. I'm afraid no bus can take you to where you want to go, John. I absentmindedly shrugged off his words and lit another cigarette. After the first drag, it hit me. I stared at the boy. He stared back, a latent intensity burning in his eyes. How do you know my name? I know a great many things. <laughs> I snorted. <laughs> yeah, sure. I know the pain you feel, John. I've seen it before, many times. I crushed the pack of cigarettes in my hand feeling anger spread through me. You don't know me. The boy then gave me a sad smile. I've seen this before. Someone loses someone close to them. As a result, you feel rage build deep inside of you, fueled by guilt because you weren't able to prevent what happened, unable to see that it was beyond your control to begin with. You could never have changed what happened, yet you cannot forgive yourself either. The mind cruelly tortures the body till your heart is riddled with sorrow. Now your existence is anguish. You wish you'd been the one to die because the thought of living on just seems too difficult. Living in this world does not seem bearable at the sight of such a loss. I remained speechless, unable to comprehend the little boy beside me. The boy sighed and scratched the back of his head. I've seen this before. After a while, it begins to look the same. The faces may change, but emotion remains constant. Your face is lined, as so many were before you. A canvas of hate and anger. The boy sighed again and jumped up from the seat. Murder will not bring her back. I spun towards the boy. What did you say? Mara is gone. Murder won't bring her back. 
The boy had spoken the words so casually it took me a moment to register them. Then, before I could stop myself, I slammed the boy against the glass wall. The entire bus stop trembled. Don't you say that name, I shouted. Tears began streaming down my face. Don't say it. The boy stared at me with a completely blank expression. He put his hand around mine and slowly pulled loose of my grip, his fingers hard as iron. I feel for you, I really do. Your daughter deserved better. <laughs> Shut up. I know you think revenge will dull the pain, but somehow using that thing in your pocket will make you feel better. I fished out the gun. The boy stared at it. For a moment I saw something dark sweep across his face. He briefly held his hand over the gun before suddenly retracting it, as if the gun had electrocuted him. That will not solve your problems. <sighs> yeah, the man deserves to die. I spat out the words with as much bile as I could muster. Then I fell back onto the metal seat, suddenly exhausted. My heart felt like it was going to explode out of my chest. I took some deep breaths, attempting to calm myself down. The boy stood motionless, staring at the rain fall before us. You know, it never gets easier, he finally muttered. After all these years of helping people cross over, it still remains difficult to let go sometimes. Some deaths are so much more deserving than others. Well, I shouldn't judge anyone, yet I can't help but feel for some of them. Occasionally, the ones I meet radiate such light it pains me to extinguish it. I don't always want to, but I have no choice. My existence is one of duty. The boy radiated an eerie calmness as he spoke. I felt my heart beat returning to normal. Who are you? How do you know these things? The boy gave me a sad smile. I uh, guess I'm a traveller. Everyone will meet me at some point in their lives. Whether it's in the beginning or the end or somewhere in between. Well, I don't understand. The boy shrugged. I wouldn't expect you to. Don't worry about it. The boy looked at his watch. The bus should be here any minute. As soon as he said those words, I could see two lights cut through the storm in the distance. The bus stopped before us and the door slid open. The boy climbed up the little stairs. Once he got to the top, he spun around. I've never done this before, but will you take a short journey with me, John? Where are we going? The boy shrugged. I'm not sure yet. All I know is that you should join me for this. I hesitantly looked at the boy. There was something about him. I felt compelled to join him. I took the boy's hand and climbed up the stairs as the door slid closed behind me. The bus driver was old. Very old. A shroud of matted white hair draped around his shoulders. Ice blue eyes stared at us. I instinctively took out my money and passed him some cash. The boy laughed and held back my hand. <laughs> I'm afraid that won't work. I don't have anything else. The boy tapped my watch. Show him that. I stuck out my arm towards the driver. He stared at it before also tapping the watch a couple of times and inspecting the unmoving dials. Seemingly satisfied... He waved us into the bus. The boy hurried to the back of the deserted bus and waved me over. I sat quietly next to him. Where are we going? The boy grinned. This journey is not about a destination per se. Then what is it about? It's about everything, the boy exclaimed, and also about nothing. Well, the boy must have seen the exasperation on my face. He cleared his throat. You should consider yourself lucky, John. I laughed at that humorously. I should consider myself lucky. Lucky that my daughter's dead. Lucky that my wife can barely stand to look at me. Lucky that my other child hasn't spoken to me in weeks. The boy's eyes grew hard. Having someone you love ripped away before their time is difficult. I understand that. 
Do you really? I muttered, sarcastic. Oh, more than you could possibly imagine, the boy answered coolly. I've guided many people before their time. I've comforted both young and old. Held the hands of both murderers and the murdered. I've held newborn babies and taken children from their parents' embrace. I've walked the fields of countless battles. I've waded through rivers of blood. Wherever I go, the dead follow. Like moths hovering before a light. You could not comprehend the endless sorrow I must navigate. He wiped a single tear from his eye. Within them I saw only grief, as if his words had opened an old wound. I suddenly felt very sorry for him. Sometimes I feel so far away from everything, the boy continued. I worry I've become too indifferent. I fulfill my duty without truly understanding what it is I should be doing. I feel like a spectator watching eternity unfold itself. I offer hope to those I meet whenever I can, without knowing whether my words are true or not. I have no idea what comes after this, John. I wish I knew. I wish I understood my purpose. My life is a paradox. My existence is perennial and yet one of insufferable solitude. Oh, you must feel lonely. The boy nodded. After that, we sat together in silence. The boy stared out of the window. He seemed deep in thought. I felt my eyelids get heavy, and before long, I'd fallen asleep. When I woke up, I felt disoriented. I looked around the deserted bus, momentarily believing I'd dreamed my encounter with the boy. Then the bus driver turned around in his seat. His blue eyes pierced through mine as he pointed at the little hill we were parked next to. He's waiting. With a quick nod, I jumped off the bus. I was panting by the time I reached the top of the little hill. The boy leaned against a tree as he observed the spectacle unravel itself below. A small crowd had gathered before a tiny grave. A priest was reading from the Bible. His actions seemed almost mechanical in their repetition. Why are we here? The boy remained silent. Whose funeral is this? The boy nodded at the crowd below them. You know whose funeral this is. I quickly scanned the crowd below us, only recognizing familiar faces. Is this my funeral? Is that what this is all about? Are you showing me what will happen if I murder Mara's killer? You know, the boy repeated, his voice a mere whisper. I looked at the people occupying the front row of chairs. My family was nowhere to be seen. My youngest daughter's godparents sat before the pitiful hole in the ground. They held each other as they cried. My knees suddenly felt weak. Slowly I slid to the floor as tears soaked the earth around me. Where am I? Jail. A simple yet sobering reply. Where is my wife? The boy's eyes remained pricked on the little crowd below as he scratched the back of his head. She's not here, John. Where is she? I was sobbing so hard now that the words left my mouth in a single slur. Your wife found her. After you were taken away, the little girl couldn't cope anymore and hung herself in Mara's room. Your wife was unable to handle the strain and had a breakdown. She's currently forcibly restrained in an asylum two hours away. Next week she'll suffer a stroke. The boy glanced at me, his eyes riddled with pity. She'll never recover. Slowly her will to live will siphon away, until only the smallest amount lies dormant in her heart. She'll be trapped in her body, a mere husk of her former self, wanting to die yet unable to do so. I would not wish such an existence on anyone. My tears had now subsided for something worse. A feeling I can hardly put to words. A feeling of loneliness so immense I could hardly breathe. I felt like I was being crushed by infinite grief. The boy smiled sadly. You see how cruel destiny is, John? By all accounts, your actions will be directly to blame for this. One moment of rage will destroy everyone you care for the most. What you seek is justice. 
What you offer is condemnation. A searing anger then took hold of me. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you torturing me like this? The boy shook his head but offered no reply. I wanted to leave. I wanted to run away and never look back, but I couldn't find the strength to get on my feet. I dropped my head in my hands. I thought I had more time. The boy smirked. Everybody always thinks they have more time. I just wish I could have told her how proud I was. The boy gently placed his hand on my shoulder. She knew. I patted his hand, unable to respond. Together we stood on the little hill in silence. Minutes crept by. Why did you really come to me? The boy scratched the back of his head and looked at me. He seemed to be deliberating with himself. Well, I've always believed myself to be bound by laws I have no control over. Laws I don't quite understand. The boy suddenly chuckled. <laughs> However, lately I met someone so outrageous they dared to challenge my path. Can you imagine a speck of dust challenging the full might of the inevitable? The boy fell silent for a moment. Then he continued. Well, she made me wonder whether I too can challenge that which seems inevitable. Maybe the constraints which bind me are self-imposed. Maybe I fear the freedom disobedience would grant me. The boy smirked. I live for those moments. Reminders of how exceptional life can be. She made me realize something, John. If she managed to find the strength to confront me, then maybe someone as lost as myself, bound by eternity, might possess the power to break free. Well, I don't understand. Sometimes when people die, their gaze manages to pierce through time, and they get a glimpse of what is to come. Your daughter saw all of this. He pointed at the crowd before them. Then he smiled, more genuine. Mara was extremely stubborn when I met her. She absolutely refused to come with me. She refused to submit to her fate, as few have done before her. Well, that thought brought a smile to my face. Do you know why she refused to come with me, John? Out of anger? The boy shook his head. Out of love. Her love for you. For her mother. For her sister. Her love was strong enough to challenge forces even I dare not resist. Oh, I was in awe of her, John. That's why I promised her to show you this. She truly was a kind child. Silent tears rolled down my face, but their sting was less painful. The boy grabbed my hands and gently pulled me back onto my feet. In time, you'll see her again. She'll be waiting for you, and for all of you. But she hoped she'd uh, still be waiting a while longer. Do you understand? I didn't have the strength to answer. All I could do was give the boy a weak nod. Together we walked back towards the bus and took our familiar seats in the back. Thank you, I said after a moment. Thank you for taking care of Mara. Thank you for helping me. The boy looked taken aback. Wherever I go, people usually fear me. They recoil at my touch, even if I only mean to help. I've always been hated because I'm a reminder of the inevitable. Never before has someone thanked me. His words carried so much emotion, I tentatively put my arm around the child's shoulder. The boy gazed up at me, tears slowly forming in his eyes. He leaned into me and cried. I let him. Before long, I felt myself falling into a deep sleep. When I woke up, we were back at the bus stop. The boy walked with me to the front as the door slid open. I walked down the little stairs. The moment my feet hit the pavement, the dials on my watch began to move once more. This is where we must part, the boy said from inside the bus. I looked back at him sheepishly. My mouth opened, but no words came out. I didn't know what to say. Where will you go from here? The boy shrugged. I don't know. 
Are you deaf? I suddenly blurted. The boy grinned as the door slowly slid closed. I sat at the bus stop long after the bus had pulled away. Then I walked back over to my car. On the bridge, I took the gun from my pocket and swung it into the river. I was ready to go home. The last bus. Nine thirty-four. It was a short, sarcastic song an hour ago, but now it's more of a bitter mantra I whisper every time I shift my weight. It's been happening more and more between the time the bus was supposed to arrive and what shows on my watch. Ten thirteen. Well, I would have been irritated regardless but the disgusting quality of the benches at this stop means my feet are suffering just as much as my patients. I don't have a choice about whether or not I wait for this latest shit asshats. I'm supposed to be his relief, the one driving the piece of crap during the graveyard shift. Well, you'd think he'd have been at the stop even before the 9.15 shift change for his own sake, but I wasn't too surprised that he was going to be late at first. It happens. But taking this long, though, I touch my phone in my pocket as I finally see a twinkle in the distance. Forgot to charge it. Not a huge problem normally since I'd be able to communicate with the radio once I was driving. But damn if it hadn't been a frustrating lack of information besides that one last indication of the so-called arrival time right before it died. Boring too since it meant I just had to stand here with nothing to do. 9.34. I sing out a final time. It's a growl that shifts to a size. I try to forget the irritation at my co-worker while he pulls in. The bus squeals slowly to a stop, air blowing out as it then pneumatically kneels. He hasn't put on the inner lights. Odd, but I hardly care as long as he gets his ass off the bus so I can try and make up some of the time he's lost by being so late. There's a shadow of a passenger ready to leave in the window as the door creaks open. The inner lights flip on, and I blink my eyes to adjust. A crooked woman stands before me, perched on the last step. I'm not close enough to block her exit, but she still doesn't leave the bus. Instead, she examines me with bruised eyes, one lidded and brown, the other fully closed and deflated. It's still carrying an uncanny sense of knowing behind the flesh that sends a shiver down my skin. Her clothes are tattered and dirty, smudged and stained, but looked like they were once the smart apparel of a white-collar worker. If they were always hers, then their change has certainly matched pace with the pallid and sickly appearance of what wrinkled skin shows outside of it. If she truly is some fallen member of the upper class, then the faded burgundy beanie she scratches at seems an odd choice to place upon her frazzled grey hair. Perhaps she's finally beginning to accept her homeless life. Well, not that it's my concern. Passenger is a passenger, however creepy, dirty, or... Oh, I sniff the air. Rotten smelling. Well, hardly the worst I've had. She is blocking the way, though, and I glance up at my co-worker, obese and sweaty and still sitting in the freaking driver's seat, his eyes firmly forward. I feel my irritation returning as I try to mentally will him out of it so I can take his place, finally. Right, you look quicker she says, her voice hoarse and scratchy. The woman turns around and steps back into the bus. Out of here, Tubbs, she rasps. Uh -huh. He answers quickly, fumbling to get out of the seat before he's even properly unbuckled the belt. Slow, she complains quietly, pulling out a long, jagged, rusty knife and roughly cutting him free. Some blood comes away with a blade as she slashes him in the process. Stunned by her action, I watch as he trips down the stairs, landing with a loud plop on the concrete. Scratching the ground with fingers and toes, he raises himself to his feet and waddles off at a quick pace. I notice a broken nail left behind. Hey! Snapping my attention towards the utterance, the woman stands in the same place with an expectant expression, the knife now gone, both hands in her pockets. She glances at the driver's seat, then back to me. She doesn't blink, just stares, her half-open eye dull and dry, 
the closed socket empty, but still seeing. The cloth at her pockets ripples with the movement of impatient fingers. I look over at the fat man attempting to escape a short distance away. His waddles have grown wider, more haphazard. They become slow stumbles, and he collapses, his body still. It hadn't looked like she'd cut him deep, yet there he lies, a scattered red trail behind him. Eyes wide, I look back at the woman as she cocks her head, scratching at the beanie, the knife in her hand. I step into the bus. She moves out of the way but remains in the aisle where I adjust things as I normally do before driving. It's strangely easy, despite the strong scent of iron that now penetrates her fetid odour. I try to put on my seatbelt, but I remember it's been destroyed, a browning stain where it's torn. Looking up into the rearview mirror, I see bodies sprawled in the back below the windows, invisible to the outside. I hear her sit behind me, and the stench of rot overcomes blood as she moves closer. You're behind schedule, she mutters. Not for long, I answer, swallowing down nervous bile as I press on the pedal. I don't intend for my relief to sing the time as he waits for me at the end of my shift. The Bus In 1975, my best friend disappeared. I'm going to tell you what happened. It won't take long, because the story is a short one. But that's a necessity of the facts. Quite simply, there aren't many. Here they are. His name was James Wade. He was 13 years old. One night he went to bed, and the next morning he wasn't there. The front door was open, and James was gone. The house, as far as anyone could tell, hadn't been broken into, and there were no signs of a disturbance. James wasn't a troubled child. And his parents were decent, loving and hard-working. They all lived together in a nice middle-class neighborhood in the suburbs. No one ever saw him again. The police had no leads, no clues and no suspects. The story pretty much starts and ends there. Pretty much, but not quite. James disappeared on a Wednesday night. I saw him in school earlier that day, and he told me that, the previous night, something had woken him up in the early hours of the morning. Exactly what, he couldn't say. It was late November, and when he'd gone to bed, the wind had been shrieking with a vengeance. But when he woke up, everything was deathly still. Maybe the sudden quiet woke him. Sleep is strange like that. Whatever it was, when he did wake, he woke with a crawling sense of dread. Like he'd just surfaced from a nightmare and, as he lay there with his heart pounding in his chest and the silence pounding in his ears, he heard something faint at first. The low, heavy growl of a big diesel engine. Somewhere close, and getting closer. Then, as it approached his house, he heard a second noise. It took him a moment to realize it was a horn, beeping gently like someone taking care not to wake the whole street. Tapping out a friendly rhythm, a kind of toot-toot, toot-toot. But it was a horrible noise, James said, tortured and unnatural, like the honking of a dying goose. He crept to the window and looked outside. Crawling down the empty street, 
at the unhurried pace of an ice cream van was an old school bus, a battered yellow GMC. One of those things that looks like a cross between a tractor and a horse box. It looked like it had been driven through a swamp. There were mud splatters radiating out from the rusted wheel arches and dead leaves rotting in the windscreen grill. The windows were streaked with grime. At least one of them was cracked. Some of the body panels had been replaced, and the bodywork was a patchwork of yellow shades, adorned with black lettering that was peeling away. Hanging off the sides of the bus like shreds of torn skin. James didn't switch on the bedroom light, and he didn't open the curtains. He just kind of peered through a crack between the drapes. But when he did, the bus rolled to a stop. It stood there for a few moments, idling in the center of the road. Then, its headlights flashed. By now, James's skin was crawling in terror. Seeing an old school bus on a quiet residential back street in the early hours of the morning was a strange sight. But it shouldn't have been one that inspired blind terror. Nonetheless, it did. James could sense that something was very, very wrong. He dived back into bed and pulled the sheets over his head. He lay there for a while, with his heart beating, and some time later, not long, maybe five minutes, he crept back to the window. The bus was outside his house. When he inched the curtains open, the horn went beep, beep. A friendly beep. A... Hey, Come on, it's time to go, beep. James went back to bed, and this time he stayed there. The horn honked a few more times. Then, a few minutes later, he heard the bus pull away. On Wednesday morning, when I saw him in school, James had black bags under blood-shot eyes. He claimed he hadn't slept a wink. He claimed he hadn't slept a wink. He was clearly distressed. I made a mistake, he kept telling me. I shouldn't have looked, he kept saying. It doesn't mean anything, I told him. It's just a bus. But nothing I said seemed to reassure him. I shouldn't have looked. I shouldn't have looked, he kept saying. And that's where my story ends. James and I went our separate ways at the end of the school day, and I never saw him again. That's it. No big reveal. No explanation. No twist. No climax. Nothing. Unfortunately, life is like that. Loose ends and unanswered questions. I'm in my fifties now. Sometimes I get nightmares. Sometimes they're the same and sometimes they're different. But even when they're different, they're just variations on a theme. Here's one. It's a late night. My car has blown a tire. I'm fixing it by the side of the road. I hear an engine. It gets closer and closer until I'm shielding my eyes from the glare of oncoming headlights. A school bus rolls by. 
As it passes me, I see a kid in the back window, banging the glass and screaming something that's lost in the roar of the GMC's huge diesel engine. It's James. He hasn't aged a day. I'm not a superstitious man. There's nothing in this story that can't be explained rationally. Maybe the bus had nothing to do with James's disappearance. Hell, maybe there was no bus. Maybe he dreamt the whole thing. Even so, I've got two children of my own, and when they were young, I told them an embellished version of this story. A story about an old school bus that cruises the streets at night. It moves very slowly, like a stalking cat, its horn honking gently. A siren song to curious children, and, if any children get out of bed, go over to the window and look outside, the bus will roll to a stop. The next time they look out of the window, it will be parked outside their house. Soon after that, maybe even the same night, that child will disappear without a trace. I told them that sometimes you can see the bus during the day. But during the day, it can't hurt you. During the day, it just travels from town to town. Sometimes adults see it too. It can't hurt the adults. Or maybe it can. It just doesn't want to. Mostly, Adults don't even notice it, but even when they do, they certainly don't notice anything strange about it. Because, although you can see through the windows, you can't see inside the bus. You can't see the children banging on the glass, crying and screaming, and wondering why the hell you're just standing there looking at them, and why the hell you don't do something. You can't see the children who gave up hope long ago and now just sit there, staring into space or sobbing into their laps. The children never get old. The bus never stops. My children cried and wouldn't sleep for a week. My wife was livid. I didn't care. I'm not saying that what I told my children is true. It's a bastardized version of what James told me, with the gaps filled in by my nightmares. Nevertheless, it seemed important to me that my children know that if ever they are lying in bed and if they ever hear the sound of an engine and a honking horn, they must ignore it. Failing that, they should run out of their rooms and come and climb into bed with me and their mother. Anything. Just don't go to the window. The bus stop. I sit in the rain every day. And a woman in a short red dress sits beside me, with her hands neatly folded in her lap. It's always raining at this bus stop, where Clark Street bisects Woody. We just sit there, our clothes getting wet and our skin feeling no moisture. We don't talk. I can turn my head to look at her, but she doesn't move at all. I'm dead, and so is this woman. Where else would she be sitting here with me if she wasn't? One car after another drives past us. Some cars stop and people get out of them. Most of the time they're teenagers. They shuffle around until they find the spot on the pavement where I die. And then they turn to look over at the bus stop through thick rain. If they see me, their image fades before I can see them scream. Like they've been washed away by the rain. I only get to see their eyes widen in fear. It used to drive me mad. Especially the blondes, but now it's just a dull annoyance. 
My life ended while chasing one of my girls across Clark Street. I met her at this bus stop. But she must have recognized me from a police sketch on the news because she took one look at me and ran. I chased after her. The look on her face was just too delightful for me to let her go. There were headlights, the bouncing of brown hair just out of my reach and her delightful screams in my ear. Pain, no pain, and the woman and the bus stop. Can't believe I died for a brunette. I would have settled for a redhead, but blonde hair was the best. I loved to wrap my hand in blonde hair and pull the silky strands until they moaned. Loved how well blood showed up in it. Speaking of blonde, the woman beside me is a blonde. Her hair falls around her face in a golden halo. She would have been one of my girls if I caught her alone on a dark night. Her only flaw is that she doesn't have red lipstick on. I loved women with red lips. I liked the way it looks on a mouth when it screamed. Can't say I'm a fan of these new colours I see on some of these girls. Blue and purple lips just don't do it for me. It used to drive me mad that I couldn't kill this woman. But again, her lips aren't painted red, so today it just became another dull annoyance. Suddenly I see the woman move out of the corner of my eye. It's the first time I've seen her do something like this. I watch while she unfolds her hands, and I see she's been hiding a tube of lipstick this entire time. She uncaps it and applies it to her lips. She looks at me, and a wide smile spreads across her cherry mouth. So, word around hell is, you like blondes with red lipstick. bus stop just opposite of my house. My name's Daniel. I'm 22 years old and my story is yet to be told. I'm trying to write it down so you can read what I've been through. When I first turned 18, I got myself a car with all the money I'd saved up from my past birthdays. The car was nothing special, but it got me where I needed to go, with occasional minor issues. I applied for a job at a factory, which I really regretted doing after my first day. My weekly payout was terrible. My boss was a terrible Japanese man who didn't speak a single word of English. My colleagues were all snitches. This factory that I used to work for had cameras everywhere. Well, their excuse was that the cameras were there because they'd have something to show the police if there was ever a break-in. <laughs> yeah, right. They were using the cameras to monitor our every move. After working there for what seemed like centuries, I finally got the money to rent a house in a shady neighborhood in Los Angeles. Anything would be better than living with my abusive relatives. I only came out during the daytime because when nighttime would fall upon us, all of the thugs pretty much came out to do their thing. Drug deals, bothering innocent people and sometimes even shootings. I'd always go to bed early so I didn't have to listen to the conversations they'd be having all the echo of police sirens in the distance. These thugs did bother me, when I'd sometimes be on my way back home from the supermarket on some evenings. They threatened me, called me white trash, telling me to get out of their neighborhood. The list just goes on and on. There was always an elderly woman standing in the bus stop just opposite of my house. Uh, she told me not to worry about these people. I found her kind of unnerving. She always told me, oh, I'll be there soon. I ignored her most of the time due to the fact she was creepy. She always gave off a foul odor and had a crooked smile. Well, this house I rented had some pretty weird things to it. When I'd wake up, some things would not be in their original place where I put them. Things were disappearing. The list goes on and on. And I'd always think it had been someone breaking into my home, but that would have been ridiculous as there were never really signs of a break-in. I remember waking one night to the sound of water coming from my bathroom faucet. I got out of bed, checked every corner of the house, and didn't find a single sign as to how this could have happened. Not one single sign. Things started to take a turn for the worse as the week progressed. I remember always locking my front and back door as well as the windows, which would be common sense to most of you. 
had always closed every single door in the house. Then, finding some of them open the next morning, mm, I never really believed in the paranormal though, so I didn't blame the scary ghosts. I was pretty shocked as to how this kind of activity could occur. I asked the owner of this house if he'd ever experienced crazy stuff like this. Well, of course, he didn't give me a proper answer and just tried to comfort me by telling me it's probably my mind playing tricks on me and I'd sometimes forget to close a door when I go to bed. Shortly after, he labelled me as a crazy individual. Yeah, the owner of the house was never nice to me. Strange disappearances of my items kept occurring. So I decided I should get some cameras. Of course, I didn't have the money for a fancy, expensive surveillance camera service, like the ones you see in Paranormal Activity. I was stupid enough to spend money on things that I didn't need, and the money could have been better used on a few cheap cameras. But these things that I don't need luckily had cameras. I'm talking about my iPhone, iPod, and my iPad. So my plan was to make these devices record overnight, while they'd be plugged into their chargers so they wouldn't run out of battery life. As night approached, I grabbed these devices, or put them in the spots where most of my items would keep on disappearing. My iPad in the kitchen, iPod in the living room to see how many items could vanish, and my iPhone in the hallway to see what would keep opening my doors. The option to place my cameras where I wanted were limited due to the fact I only had three of them. So, I finally hit the big red dot on all of the screens to get them to record. I had a little struggle with placing them correctly to get a full view of every room, but after a while, I got them all in the proper position, except for my iPad. I went to bed maybe a few minutes after I'd made the devices start recording. I'd been lying in bed maybe five minutes when I heard a door opening downstairs. Well, I was scared and excited at the same time, considering I finally had some footage to see of what or who had been doing this of late. Shortly after I heard a door opening downstairs, I heard something fall and shatter onto the floor. Oh, my heart was racing. Shortly after, I fell asleep. The next morning I woke up and went to check on my devices to see if they were still recording. They were all still recording. Good. Well, one thing caught my eye whilst I was picking them up. My iPad was lying with the screen aiming down at the floor. I picked it up and shook it off by just telling myself it had probably fallen down considering it was in a bad position. The screen was fine, it was still recording. I tapped the button to make it stop. I'd captured eight hours of footage on all the devices. After extracting every clip to my computer, I started reviewing them. And I saw something I did not want to see. Coming from the door that led into my garage was the creepy elderly woman who was always standing at the bus stop just opposite of my house. I noticed my clock read 10.25pm. Well, she proceeded to go and sit on my sofa, talking some kind of gibberish to herself, pretty loudly. I was surprised I'd never woken up to this. After sitting on the couch for two long hours, she stood up and started making her way to the kitchen. And she noticed my iPad recording her. She approached the device and stared creepily into the camera lens. After looking into the lens for five minutes, she then knocked over a glass at my iPad. Luckily, she didn't notice my iPod recording her walking into the living room again and back into the garage. But after that, she no longer came out of the garage. I was in total shock. I didn't even dare set foot there. Well, I immediately moved out of this house. I now knew how my items had been disappearing and how my doors kept opening. Well, I live with my girlfriend now. And I've only just realized what she meant by, I'll be there soon. Crazy Bugs For years my parents told me about a crazy bus crash that happened near our house years ago. One morning, just days before I was born, my mother had been out in the garden, plucking weeds, when she heard a terrible noise a series of high-pitched screams, then screeching tires, followed by a tremendous crash. All of the people in the area rushed out of their houses to see what was going on. 
down at the bottom of the old coach road. They found tire marks leading to a nearby cliff. They saw the wreckage of a bus down below. It had apparently driven straight off a cliff and crashed down the jagged rocks at the bottom. People ran down to where the smoking wreckage was lying strewn about in an effort to help survivors. And they were horrified when they discovered that it was the local school bus and all the passengers on board were their own children. The bodies of the dead kids lay tangled in the twisted metal. Some had been thrown out of the bus as it fell and their bodies had smashed against the rocks, killing them on impact. Others had been decapitated by flying glass and shards of metal inside the bus. The parents were screaming and crying as they found the mangled remains of their sons and daughters in the charred wreckage. When the ambulance and fire department arrived, they found no survivors. Every single child on the bus had been killed in the crash. It was the most horrific disaster the area had ever experienced. In one horrible moment, the entire generation had been wiped out, and the parents of the dead children were inconsolable. A few days later, a huge funeral was held for the kids who'd perished. People came from miles around to pay their respects and share in the grief. Almost every family in the area had lost a child in the incident. Some had even lost two or three. Almost 40 small coffins were lowered into the ground that day. An inquest was held shortly afterwards and the police got to the bottom of what had happened and finally determined who was to blame for causing the terrible crash. It seemed that a mental patient from the local insane asylum had escaped the night before. He'd broken into the bus station and stolen a driver's uniform. That night he lay in wait until the doors of the bus station were unlocked. Then he crept aboard the school bus and drove out through the gates without alerting anyone. That morning he drove the bus along the countryside picking up unsuspecting children who were waiting by the roadside. He was dressed in a bus driver's uniform, so nobody suspected a thing. Once he collected every kid on the route, the mental patient floored the accelerator and drove at high speed off the cliff. The people in that area never forgot the terrible accident that the escaped mental patient had caused. When I was growing up, there weren't many kids to play with. Most had been killed by the crazy bus crash. The only kids who survived were too young to attend school at the time. Now the story I'm about to tell was when I was 13 years old. My parents allowed me to go to the movie theatres in town. I met a bunch of friends there and we had a great time watching the movie. And afterwards we lost track of time and it was very late by the time we decided to go home. I must have been waiting at the bus stop for half an hour before I realised that I'd missed the last bus. Cursing myself for being so careless wondered how we'd managed to get home. It wasn't that far of a walk, perhaps a mile or two, but the roads were treacherous at night. In our area, there were no streetlights along the way. A lot of people had been hit by cars as they were walking in the darkness. I found a payphone and called Mom. She answered and I told her that I'd missed the last bus home. Oh, she began to panic, telling me that my father was out and had taken the car with him. She wouldn't be able to pick me up. I told her I'd walk home, but she begged me not to, saying that the roads were much too dangerous at night. Even worse, it was beginning to snow, which meant that even if a car did manage to see me in the night, it probably wouldn't be able to have time to hit the brake before it hit me. She said that she'd try to contact our neighbours and see if they'd be able to drive into town and pick me up. After I hung up, I began to get impatient, and eventually I decided that it was best just to walk home, hoping for the best. I was walking along the lonely, dirt country road, trying not to trip into a ditch or pothole, when I saw headlights behind me. Whether it was a car or a bus, it was coming very fast and quite noiselessly through the snow-covered road. As it drew nearer, I could make out the outlines of the vehicle. Well, it appeared to be a bus, and my only hope was that the driver would be able to see me and stop for me. It came around the bend of the road and bathed me in bright light. The headlights blazed through the darkness like a pair of fiery meteors. I jumped to the side of the road and waved my hand, but the bus passed me at full speed, and, and for a moment I feared that it had missed me. But then I heard screeches, and it had stopped for me a short distance away. I ran as fast as I could to the bus, and came up to it as the door swung open. As soon as I stepped in, the door shut behind me, and the driver took off again at full speed. 
The bus was very dark inside, but as my eyes began to adjust, I could see it was almost full, despite the fact it was late at night. I found a vacant seat and sat down, resting my weary legs. The atmosphere felt cold, colder, if possible, than outside, and there was a strange and disagreeable smell. I stopped and looked around at the other passengers. They seemed silent. Well, they didn't seem to be asleep, but each of them just looked ahead. The deathly silence was unsettling, and the smell was quickly becoming unbearable. I felt much too ill to say anything at all, and the icy coldness inside the bus chilled me to the bone. The strange smell was making me really sick. Shivering from head to toe, I turned to the young boy next to me and asked if he could open the window. He didn't answer. He didn't even blink. I repeated the question more loudly, but still no answer. When I could no longer take the stench, I reached across and tried to open the window, but the latch broke off in my hands. It was then that I noticed the window was covered in cobwebs and mildew. In fact, every part of the bus started to look in a terrible state of disrepair, almost decay. The leather seats were crusted with mold, and the floor was literally breaking and rotting away from my feet. I turned to the boy next to me again and asked, What's wrong with this bus? Without saying a word, he turned his head slowly and looked me in the face. I'll never forget that look as long as I'm alive. My heart turned cold and blood drained from my face. His eyes were so wide it was as if they were going to pop. His face was as leathery and pale as a corpse. His bloodless lips were drawn back, showing big yellow teeth. The word that I was about to utter died upon my lips, and a dreadful feeling of horror came upon me. I became aware that everyone on the bus was staring at me with the same look on their faces. Their awful faces were rotting flesh, and their shirts were covered in dirt. Only their eyes, their terrible eyes, were living, and all their eyes were staring at me menacingly. A shriek of terror burst from my lips as I ran down the aisle. I threw myself against the door and tried to open it. In that single instant, as the door swung open, I heard a crash and the bus rocked back and forth like a ship. Then I heard many, many children screams before it went black. It seemed as if I'd been unconscious for days as Mum woke me up in the hospital. She told me that I'd fallen over a cliff near the old coach road. The only reason I didn't die was because I'd fallen in a snowdrift on some jagged rock. I had two broken legs, a broken arm, and a deep scratch on my forehead. I'd been found by a farmer who'd taken me to the local hospital. Well, some call me a liar. Some call me crazy, but you can think what you want. But I was a passenger on the crazy bus. So, um, a collection of stories there about buses and bus stops. Doesn't sound very scary when I describe it like that, does it? But, um, hope you enjoyed that collection of stories. Uh, pretty creepy. A bit sad in some places, but nice collection of stories nonetheless. Well, Wednesday's upon us. Tomorrow, next episode of the podcast is out, and it's a real belter. So, if you're not subscribed already, uh, please check it out. Uh, link's in the video description. Available pretty much anywhere where you get your podcasts. Nice collection of stories tonight. Um, a few that were sent directly to me, and a few that I found on the Creepypasta Wiki. Still a great source for many, many wonderful stories. So, yeah, back again on Friday here, tomorrow on the podcast. Hope to see you wherever I see you. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. 
very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.